make games, and I'm just going to talk to you about how I learned to make games. Um, I'm not going to really tell you how to make games, I'm just going to tell you how I figured out how to make games. Um, basically, my story is I knew literally nothing about making games, I wanted to make games, I decided to learn how to make games, so I made games. Hello. <laughs> Uh, before I get into the main part, though, uh, a couple things um, about me. I've always loved games my whole life. I've played them for, you know, since I was a kid. NES was my first system. I played all those games and everything. Um, I, and I thought sort of in the back of my mind, it would be really cool to make a game, but I never really thought it would be a possibility, just because I never knew anything about programming, <coughs> anything at all. And it was just this distant dream, like, ah, I can't you know, make them, I can't do that. That's, that's just not something I can do. Um, but then, uh, a couple years ago, I realized, you know what, the internet is a thing, and somewhere I can learn how to make games. Like, why can't I? People learn stuff on the internet all the time. So I just Googled one day, how do you make a game? And I could start it, and this is the story about that. Um, the last thing is, even if you're not into games or anything, this kind of process could be used for anything. It's basically just, um, the, the basic premise of it is the way to learn something is to just do it over and over again. It seems like common sense, but it's, it's easy to forget that when you're struggling with something that you're new to. And so I'm just going to show you basically a ton of different games I made on my process to learn how to make games. Um, and one last thing before I get into this, I have to explain something about my name because otherwise I'd be really confused. My name, my last name used to be Blackall, the second name right there, and my wife's name used to be Tesser. And we thought, you know, instead of just doing the regular she takes my name thing, or the hyphenation thing, we thought, you know, why not make something up? So we, we took four letters from each last name. Tearball, which is the worst last name ever. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then we, we anagrammed it, and then we turned it into Trebella. So Trebella is actually a made up name. I'm not Italian, even though a lot of people now think I am. But uh, yeah, so on, on a lot of the screenshots, you might see Blackhall in some places because that was my name before. I got married in November of 2011, so, so that explains that. All right, so to get started, the first thing I did um, when I was trying to figure out how to make games was check out Python. Python is a good language to start with, um, just because it's pretty simple and there aren't a lot of rules to it. Um, there's a site called inventwithpython.com, and it's a free ebook, and it just basically taught me just these super basics about learning how to program. And just to prove to you that I really didn't know how to program, this was a sentence in the book that I remember thinking, oh, that's good to know. The plus sign tells the computer to add the numbers two and two. To subtract numbers, use the minus sign. And to multiply numbers, use an asterisk. I remember thinking, oh, cool, it's like a calculator. I just, I, it was so new to me, I didn't really get it at all. So um, through Inventive Python, there were a ton of different tutorials. And so I'm going to take you through a couple of those tutorials that I started with and how I kind of progressed from there. Um, and this was a tweet I, I sent out on the day that I first started. It was, uh, what have I gotten myself into? I've just embarked on learning programming, having absolutely no experience. Oh man, I'm already nervous. And I love looking at this tweet just from now. Uh, it's in October 2010. Just to see it and how far um, I've come and how much I've learned, it's just it's fun to go back. Um, and these are all people who faved it, but those weren't people who faved it at the time. I, I, I did recently, found it again. Um, okay, so the first game uh, that was a tutorial was Guess the Number, and very, very simple game. Basically, all you do is just try to guess what the computer is thinking. A number from 1 to 10. And it's just a basic text-based game, and that's about it. Second, it wasn't even a game, it was just a list of jokes, basically learning how to use strings and stuff like that. And you just kind of push enter a bunch of times, and it, it tells you these stupid jokes. Third game uh, made based, based on a tutorial was Tic-Tac-Toe. Getting a little bit cooler because it has some graphics, even though it's sort of text-based graphics, it still was neat to be able to see an actual image rather than just text. Um, I really liked this one uh, because it used text in a creative way. It was like a battleship game, where, but it was the opposite, where you found, uh, you're trying to look for treasure instead of trying to blow up a ship. But I thought it was pretty cool how they used the, uh, the different symbols to make the waves. 
Um, so after showing you a couple of those tutorials, I want to talk about the difference between tutorials and your own creations, because it's a huge difference. Um, tutorials teach you just basic syntax and, and what you're supposed to do and, and how to do it basically. Um, they teach you how to copy from one thing to another and to copy the code. Um, you don't really run into bugs though, um, unless the tutorial author has a bug in it, which is just really problematic. Um, and there's not, there's not really a problem solving because uh, you just copy it. It doesn't really teach you anything problem-wise. And problem solving is one of the biggest, most important things in making games, or any, anything. Right. Um, so the difference between tutorials and creations is creations, like I said, teach you how to solve problems. You're going to run into bugs. And even though at the time it seems like you'll never be able to fix them, that's, those are the best learning experiences uh, in terms of learning. And you will run into despair, thinking, I will never get out of this. I had that multiple times, thinking I will never be able to get out of this problem, and I don't know, and I'm never going to learn anything. But um, that's, again, that's part of the learning process. And then finally, when you fix those problems, the satisfaction of solving those problems is just incredible. It makes it all worth it. So <laughs> just to prove that uh, this is how I felt at the time, this was the second day. Day right after that first tweet. I now understand the horrors of fixing bugs and the joy one gets when it's finally solved. So it's terrible, but when you fix it, it's so worth it. And I was already hooked from there the second day. Um, now, this is my first real game that I created not based on a tutorial. Now, it, in a way, it was based on a tutorial because it's essentially the guess the number game. But um, if you can see, it goes like this. Uh, the name of the game is The Man Wrote It is in a Barn. I don't know why I thought of The Man Wrote It. It's just some weird thing I made up. And so this is what the computer says. There's a man wrote it in the town, and he has stolen money from the townspeople. You have to find it and get their money back. And then you just try to guess where he is. The bush, the broken treehouse, Uncle Crotch's tavern, the barn, or the floorboards. And so you just enter the number, and then it responds once you found it. And, um, you know, it's it so stupid, and it was just... Um, basically the same as a guess the number, but I had some of my own little uh, touch on it, had some creativity in there, and it made it feel new and different. And I also didn't just copy it from the book. I tried to mem remember what I learned from the book, create something new. Um, and even though it was super basic, I could share this. I shared it on Twitter, I put it on Reddit, like joking that it's like, gonna be like a million dollar making game. Um, and someone, <laughs> this awesome person on Reddit made this, this box art for it. It was just <laughs> incredible. And I just found that hilarious, and so and that was cool too. Like just a little indication already that the community was so supportive of me, because um, people were always just really supportive of me learning. And awesome, and I'm just one example of that. All right. So the next thing, next big game, I a big game I made was Minesweeper, and Minesweeper is always one of my favorite games growing up on the computer, um, just because I love the logic of it, and I thought it'd be cool to make a Minesweeper in Python. This is a lot more complicated than Man Wrote It the Barn, though. Um, I think this is like a week later or something. Um, it taught me a ton of technical issues. Um, this is something I said at the time. My code is messy and sort of a hack job, but it works, and that's all I really care about. My code will get better and better the more I do this. And I think that's really important. Um, it's so easy to get just bogged down with feeling stressed about, this isn't the right way to do it. I don't know if this is the right class to do, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. If it works, it works. You know, performance and stuff will come later, uh, especially when you're learning. So um, to keep with the kind of silliness that I was doing, um, I made a trailer for this, and it was totally, you know, totally just stupid, pretending that it was like my huge game. Um, at the time, I did I was doing music for some games, and that's what it's. <laughs> so fully customized with the boards.
and that's our flags in. So I just think it's important, you know, I, I was always really um, trying to have a good time because I know it, I wasn't, I, I was sort of stressed all the time that I had so much to learn. It was stressful to me thinking, you know, I really want to just make an iPhone game, but I can't. I'm so dumb with programming right now. So I, I tried to make it fun, even if it's a small victory. All right, so. After Minesweeper, I felt pretty good about Python. I felt like pretty, I understood it pretty well, so I moved on to iOS. And um, so I, I found this tweet recently, I totally forgot about it. It said, how long do you think it'll take to go from learning basic programming to publishing an iPhone game? Was anyone in a similar situation? No one responded to it, but uh, I just found this tweet recently, and uh, I realized it was on October 26th, and I launched my first iPhone game on April 26, 2012. So it's, it was exactly 1.5 years. I wish I could go back and tell myself. Although if I had known, that probably would have been stressful. Um, all right, so at this point I felt really lost because I was doing all these console-based graphics, text-based things, and just thinking of making the jump from that to visual graphics was just huge and really just totally confusing to me. Um, I read some books on C and Objective-C, which is Objective-C is the language for iPhone. Now it's going to be Swift. Um, I learned a lot, but I felt completely lost, um, and, and I just didn't really understand how you could ever go from using code to control visuals. Um, and I felt really overwhelmed. I didn't know, you know what a sprite was, a class, object, delegate, anything like that. Um, it was just a big change in, in the thought process that I needed to do. It's probably the biggest leap that I had to make going from the text-based Python games to the iOS games, and that's why it was the most stressful, just because I felt like, many times I felt like I don't know if I'm ever going to do this. But, you know what, I kept going, and because I really wanted to make this work, so I'm just going to take you through a bunch of little dumb things I made along the way. The very first app I made was this. Not even all the buttons did anything, but I could actually put stuff on screen. I actually had the app on my phone, I was like, that's so cool. That showed people like, look, I made an app. It's the dumbest app ever, but it's there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think only the first two items did anything at all. But just the fact that I had something on the screen on the phone just felt really good. Um, so I feel extremely overwhelmed after reading this chapter in delegates and a bunch of other stuff. I feel like I'll never learn, inspire me. So again, another example of my feeling like I just can't do this, but I always came back to it because I really wanted to make it work. Um, now I want to take you through tic-tac-toe because it sort of a um, thing that happened with a lot of games uh, that I made, but I, for some reason I live tweeted this one kind of, because you'll see my frustration kind of come out and also the, the amazing feeling when I end up making it work. Um, so, trying to make Tic-Tac-Toe on the iPhone and having issues. Now, you know, I, I made Tic-Tac-Toe earlier with Python, but first of all, that was a tutorial, so it didn't really teach me how to make Tic-Tac-Toe, I just kind of copied it. Second of all, using visuals was so different because now I had to figure out where the person's finger was and where the touch was and where that represented the, the boxes and whether it had an X or an O. And it was way complicated, more complicated than I expected. As you can see here, never knew how amazingly complex it would be. Then I get this issue. Debugging my iPhone tic tac toe prototype, I hate you, it is like bad access or whatever. And if you're an iPhone developer or an iOS developer or anything, or maybe, maybe this is another thing to do. That's like very common, and now it's not as scary to me because I kind of know what it means, but at the time it was so unhelpful. Was, so there are certain bugs and things that when they happen, you kind of know how to fix them. When this happened, I was like, I'm screwed, I can't do this. There's no, nothing I can do. And so I had to go to bed, I'm like completely dysfunctional, take back toe, and I'm depressed because of it, and it's just really frustrating. As you can see here, I'm extremely frustrated with the tic tac toe. Seeing I'm trying to send an object and index to a string, but it's an array. Ah, you know. Finally, I was like, all right, fine, I can't do this. I'm just going to ask people for help. So I need help. I'm calling any followers to help me, and I'll upload the source file to someone who can be so kind to check it out. Please download this project, see what the tic tac toe 
whatever. And finally, I had a bunch of people that, uh, help me out, and I actually got it to work. And it just proved to me that you know like, you can always try as hard as you can, and sometimes just ask someone who's, who knows what they're doing, because there's really no better solution than asking a seasoned programmer if you're having a really bad issue, because they can probably fix it in a second. And I actually like to do that now with beginners who come to me for help. I think it's a lot of fun to help you know, do, do what these people did for me, them. Um, often simple seeming things uh, require mental gymnastics, so that's something I learned there. Um, also, I, I just I needed to keep in mind that I will figure it out because it did work out. I, I just had these feelings that it would never work, but it did. And so, yeah, okay. so I can take you on to another, another couple of things more Cocoa apps, just basic iOS apps. I made a fraction calculator and um, based on a tutorial, but it was cool because I actually used my own graphics, and it was cool to actually see these little squares I drew in Photoshop on the iPhone, so that helped. Um, yes and no, fantastic app. You just tap no, and it says no. Yes, and it says yes. And I mean, yeah, But I was learning how to use buttons and how to hook them up to text and things like that. Um, now, <laughs> this is another thing I always like to do, is just, I don't know why, but I just like to put my face in things. And so I took, this is a picture, this is me, this is Dana, my wife. And I just like made a little circle, and then I was learning how to, to use visuals uh, on the screen, use sprites and make them so they bounced and never left the screen. So just learning how to use like X and Y placements and things like that. Um, but you know, I could use a circle that's a white circle, but I, it's more fun when it's my face. Um, and that led me to making break with, it's like a breakout clone in my head. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and then I made a, a little MASH 3 thing just to kind of learn what grid-based um, programming was like. That's kind of a precursor to what my final first game was. It wasn't a MASH 3, but this is kind of where I first started getting into that grid-based programming that I really liked. Learning multidimensional arrays and things like that. Um, then, I, then I made Jumpy Guy. Um, because I wanted to learn animation, so when you tap him, he, he goes like this, and um, that was pretty cool. So, because it actually had, I actually had a character on screen, so that felt really good. And, and this is why I told you about the name thing earlier. Is whatever you develop, whatever black ball is probably pretty amazing. Then I did an eye tennis tutorial. This was strictly based on a tutorial, but after I did this one, I felt pretty good about basic Coco, so I was ready to go into Coco Studio. And if you've done iPhone game programming, uh, this is a pretty big game engine, and uh, it just makes things easier to make games with. Um, it's a game engine for iOS, and you can see it was recommended to me by Matt Ricks, who made Trainyard from Toronto. Um, he has been super inspiring for me throughout this whole process. I was my first game was inspired by Trainyard. He helped me get started with Copa City because Trainyard was made into Copa City, and just helped me a lot along the way. And um, Cocoa Studio has progressed a lot since I used it, so it's pretty different now. I think probably the documentation is better. It also is more cross-platform and things like that. But when I was using it, it was still, you know, wasn't documented well, so it was still kind of a tough learning process. Um, one of the first games I made with this was Star Shooter, um, based on a tutorial from RayWenderlich.com, which that site's amazing, not just for iPhone tutorials, but for tons of anything programming and visual. Um, and, but now it actually was cool because it was starting to feel like a game. Um, you could press the, I don't even remember, you tap the screen and shoot the star and try to hit the red alien head guy or whatever. And I put sound effects in it so when you got hit it was like, you know, it just made it come to life. And then I made a palm thing and I was learning multi-touch so that you could touch the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen at the same time so it was like local multiplayer. Um, then I was inspired by Tilt to Live, which I did the music for, um, and it was one of my favorite iPhone games, and I just wanted to see how much I could kind of copy the feel of it, and I also wanted to learn the accelerometer so that you tilted it and moved it around, and in Tilt to Live you get killed when you hit the red dots, so I made it so that you can collect the red dots, so it's a sort of change, a change it up. But, uh, but now it's really starting to feel cool because it's, it's actually, you're moving around and it's, I'm really controlling visuals now. I'm starting to get excited about what that means. 
And I made this thing where I took a picture of a couple pieces of paper and cut out a little circle in Photoshop and, um, and used the accelerom accelerometer to move it around. But at first, the ball would just move like this. But um, I figured out how to make it turn correctly when you use the accelerometer, which felt cool because it was like going back to trigonometry that I hadn't done since high school and things like that. And it just felt cool. It was like, oh, this is how math is used in programming. This, so far, I've mainly just done logic in programming. I haven't really done math. I've always loved math, so it's cool to bring that in. This is inspired by Bumpy Road. Samogo is one of the greatest developers right now, I think, in iOS. Um, and this is one of the games at the time. And I just saw that uh, thing, the way that the mechanic works. I was like, how, I wonder how that works. So I just kind of copied it Bumpy Road. Then, um, Party Man came around. Um, I wanted to practice animation in Coco City, so the thing on the right is what I made. When you when you tap the screen, he would, um, he would do that, and when you let go, he would stop, and music would play when you're holding it. So it was like this party while you're holding it, and then you would freeze. Um, and I tweeted this out, and people jokingly joked with me, saying, this is going to be a major, huge game. And uh, Craig Sharp from Retrograder drew this awesome uh, just sort of depiction of what Party Man actually looks like. That was hilarious. Um, then I made Pizza Guy, this guy running, and, and the top version is my art. And then I asked a friend online, Michael Custinger, to make some, to see if he wanted to make some. He made a better look of Pizza Guy, some cool mountains in the background. And I made a trailer for this one, too, so it's, uh, it's much better. <laughs> So, yeah, um, so not only did I learn, well, what was that? Not only did I learn how to do um, just basic uh, parallax, which is the reason I first wanted to make this, just to learn parallax when the background is moving, but also um, using the progress bar of this jumping, like saving up how long you've been holding to make the jump higher, it's just kind of a cool mechanic to play with. Um, so I was learning more and more how to make cool mechanics and also, um, starting to look more and more like an actual game. So it's really good. Now this is Train Yard on the left. Um, and so Party Man came back. And uh, it became, a, it's, it's, it's the new Mario. Um, this is Party Man now. And I took that, I photoshopped out that, that drawing that Craig Sharp drew and put it in the game. And um, I just did, I just want to see if I could make a Train Yard-like path. Because I was curious how that mechanic worked. And it's a good way to learn. You just see something, you try to make it. Um, and so I did it, and you can actually draw the path. And what you do is hit make party, and just tap a square, and then the party starts. And there's just like a, like a flashing strobe light. And then you hit start bus, and the bus drives to it. And once the bus, if the bus reaches the party, the party comes out and starts dancing. So it, was, it wasn't a very difficult game, but it was just a cool way to learn um, how to use sort of that grid-based drawing. Then Party Man 2, Party Bus 2, Party Man's Big Weekend, was a sequel. Um, <laughs> I made a new UI for it, which is really ugly now in retrospect, but I thought it, was, I thought it would be cool to make like, this manual UI, but it's really terrible. <laughs> but, um, but now there's a depot for the bus to leave from, um, and this thing, this slider, was the speed at which the bus could drive, so I wanted it to be able to drive really slowly, because that's another train here, I think, and I was wondering how he did that. But I learned an important lesson here with the difference between representative index for storing location and exact float, like pixel location. And um, I wasn't using in, an index or anything for where the bus was. It was just like, the bus has traveled 42.3 pixels into the first square, and he has 23.2 left. And it, it just the math got super messed up. And I made it to just add insult to injury. I put a um, code in there so that if the bus went to the end of the path without reaching a party, um, he would crash. Um, and so, but basically what the, when the program didn't recognize where the bus should be, the bus crashed. So 
instead of my app crashing, the bus literally crashed all the time in the middle of the path. And I didn't understand why, because it was, I was using the way, the way that you know, the location was stored really badly. But it was just frustrating, because I would you'd be driving along and just crash on a corner. Like, why are you crashing? So that was a big lesson in terms of more grid-based programming, which I keep, kept coming back to. Then I made Snake and uh, translated from a Flash tutorial. And learning to translate it from Flash to Google CD was a big project that it taught me a lot. Um, and I also had kind of a totally breakthrough, totally big breakthrough in terms of how I thought about making a uh, snake game. Because I always thought of it like the, uh, the head would move, and then the one next to it would move, the one next to it, and all the pieces would move every frame. And in this tutorial, it was talking about how that's not how it works at all. The head is a new sprite every time, and all the other pieces stay there and then the tail gets cut off. So it's like the pieces don't actually move. It's just the pieces are falling around where the head is supposed to be. Kind of hard to explain, but it really changed my whole view on how that would work. It's like, that is amazing. There's so many things like that in programming. That UI on that one's terrible, too. Um, doodle Clone, I made a Doodle Jump inspiration. And it taught me about collisions and how terribly hard they are, and also one-way collisions and how that's like Harder, just making sure that this guy jumps on one of these and doesn't fall through it, and being able to go through up through it but not down through it is crazy complicated for me, but um, it ended up working out. So after this, I took about six months off of programming. I had been doing it for about six months. I was getting a little bit burnt out. I made all these little games, but I still felt like, I don't know if I'm ready to make a big game. So I kind of went back into doing a lot of music for other games and things like that. Um, but about six months later in August, I took, um, I checked out Flixel, which was a Flash um, ActionScript 3 library engine for games. And at first it was a little tricky because I had to learn a new language, but it was, it's kind of like learning an instrument. Once you learn one, it's a lot easier to learn another one. Plus, ActionScript is a relatively easy language to learn. So, um, when I got back into this, it really kind of motivated me again to make games again. It, was, it really brought me back. Like, I did this in August, maybe August or September, and then I finally started making my real game that December. So it really just kind of get me pepped up again to make a game. And I wanted to show you now, this is later, and it's a much better version of Snake. Now, hopefully this will work. And this was a flick soul. Snake. And I love Flixel's um, shake screen thing, it's really cool. Okay, and then I made, um, after that, I made this racer game. And I was really happy with the effect that happens when you crash. This is just the difficulty level. <laughs> so, I was really happy with those two games, um, especially because I had just I hadn't spent too, too much time learning Flixel, and it was a cool thing that I could make in this game, and in two games like that, relatively quickly. And I was like, you know what, I think I might be ready to make a real game. So, Polymer is the next step, and that is my that is my first real, at least, commercial game. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, it started out as another dumb game, just like all the other ones. Um, it was like this number matching thing. And somehow it transitioned into this. I realized that the numbers were kind of unimportant. They were detracting from the game, so I just turned them into shapes. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a great draw artist in terms of drawing or anything, so abstract, simple shapes were perfect for me. Um, and it's kind of like a match three, but to explain the, the way it works is it's sort of like Rubik's Cube. You have to make sure that all the pieces connect. And if there are no incomplete half circle dots, then the piece can be used and get points for it. Um, and then I'm just going to show you a couple different iteration examples of how this changed. This is what it used to be. Um, and in some ways, it, I, looking at it now, it's kind of nice. It looks a little clear. But the design just progressed over time. And I didn't have the name yet. And Mito was like Mito, some sort of scientific thing. I don't remember now. But, um, 
the, the fonts were different, the, um, the UI was different, there weren't as many things going on. Now, the one on the right is the, the way it finally looked at the end, and it's a little bit, you know, maybe a little bit kind of uh, complex looking, but it's unified. All the fonts are the same. Um, the, the bar on the top has stuff going on, and it looked really weird in the platform. And so that's just one example of how it changed. And that's the kind of polish that I didn't do on all the other games. Um, another example, this bombs mode. Basically, you have to destroy the bombs to uh, get points and survive. And um, the first one on the left is how it started. You, you had five circles, and as you used the bomb, the circles would go away. But I realized that didn't really make sense. It didn't really indicate what was going on. Why are you using the bombs? What happens when the bombs are getting used up? Um, so then I tried this thing, this little progress bar with an arrow on the tutorial saying, destroying bombs depletes the bar above. When it runs out, the amount of bombs increases how long it last. And no one's going to read that. That's <laughs> just way too wordy. It's, it, I realized that that was just a terrible way to explain it. So I, had to, I wanted to have something that just made more sense right away. And also, why, are, why is the bar depleting? when you're progressing. So instead, now the wave, the bar progresses as you get to the next wave, and also waves are something that people kind of already know. It then requires much explanation. Just another example of the kind of iterative process that I went through a lot of different things. I happened upon a lot of bugs. This was one that somehow it kept um, making this unlock screen over and over, like every frame. So just, <laughs> Um, I didn't really have a good method of dealing with to-dos. I emailed myself a million times. I printed out things, crossed them out. But now I use, now for my new stuff, I use Trello.com. I think that just works really well. You can use subtasks and things like that. I'm not on the team, but if you are, you can assign it to people. It's really cool. um, and then IAPs, in-app purchases. Um, my, my views on in-app purchases have kind of evolved over time, as the uh, no okay guys know. Uh, I, it was first designed without in-app purchases, totally. Um, the unlock progression was a natural thing where you played it, you played it, and you unlocked stuff as you went. And near the end, when I was about to release it, I was like, you know, why not just add an in-app purchase to see, you know, it'll give someone an option to skip if they want to pay for it. And uh, that, um, I'll come back to that later, but at the time I was thinking, you know, who cares? You, you don't have to pay. You can play the game and get everything if you want, so why does it matter? So that's kind of how I thought at the time, but I sort of evolved in my thoughts on that. This is the polymer launch. Um, my, my wife we got an awesome polymer cake from Whole Foods. I made this stupid image on Twitter of me and the polymer. And this is the rankings. Um, so we got up to the 58th highest in the game, in US games, 107th in the US apps. Um, to date, it's gotten about 15,000 paid downloads, 700,000 free downloads because it was on a uh, app gratis or something like that. Um, and you know, it didn't it didn't make me rich, but it was really awesome you know, for a first game. I was super excited about this, and, and uh, it was just really was. It felt really good that I finally released a game and I made money on it. And I'm going to show you just the trailer of it. So that was Polymer, and um, like I said, I was super excited to finally release the game. People in the, in the you know, game development community were super uh, 
supportive because they know how long I've been learning a program. And it just, it meant a lot that a lot of my Twitter friends would help to spread the word and everything like that. Um, after this, there's some IAP backlash. And now this is a minor thing. I, I, I'm, it, it's an exaggeration to assume that this was a huge thing because most of the people who got the game didn't care. But these are just some tweets I got from really respected developers that I really, you know, I really respect these guys. And really, well, Mr. Reader. So this is Adam Atomic. He made Flixel and <coughs> Hannibal, which was like one of my favorite Apple games. This is why I wish the App Store had labels for bait games, fucking waste of 99 cents, like for nothing. And the idea that let's make a puzzle game that will throw all the features in the car, so all the on sale, and then sell the game inside. This guy said, even as a developer myself, I feel like a bit like I paid for a light version there. Nice music, though. Um, this is another guy, uh, this is my favorite Palmer review. Seriously, Travella, your game is fun, but you get super greedy with the IP. Um, this is like Tetris, and Tetris started you out with one kind of block and one game mode and charges you a dollar and unlock the rest of the game. Totally ridiculous, don't waste your time. And then Bennett Foddy, who made Quap, and Super Pole Riders, another guy who really, really respects this game developer. Um, I really like your game a lot, but I think you really diminished it by adding all that unlock nonsense. So when this first when these first things first happened, I was, was not prepared to hear this kind of criticism. Like, I've, people were always really supportive um, during my learning process, and also with my other games, they're just dumb games. They didn't really represent my true artistic merit that I was trying to portray. And this was like my first real attempt, so criticism was a lot harder to take. Um, so I didn't take it well. I was really upset about it for a long time. Um, this is the first time I've really been judged for uh, something outside of my dumb games. Um, and just because it was my first real game, it was harder to take. And now, I, again, to say it really was a vocal minority. It was not like I was getting bad reviews all over the store. This was not a ton of people. So I want to make it clear that most people are probably fine with this. But it, was just, it really made it hard because of some of the people that I really respect the most were saying this. Now, about a year later, um, this is like maybe six months ago now, I sort of reevaluated my opinion on in-app purchases, and I kind of came to the conclusion that even though some of the ways that the people said it to me, I didn't really appreciate, I do agree with what their points were, especially um, the, the in terms of feeling like the unlock in-app purchases kind of detract from the gameplay. Because even though I designed the game to not have been at purchase, and I totally designed it from that standpoint, there's no way for the user to know that. Um, the user sees uh, it's going to take about maybe half an hour to unlock a piece. And all they see is you can spend the time or you can spend the money. And some people like that, but personally, I, that ruins the gameplay. Because then it just makes that 30 minutes of playing seem like you know, it's pointless. All you're doing is um, not paying. And it totally changes the, the thought of it. Now, some people are really against in you know, purchases for moral, ethical reasons, and I don't normally care about that. It's not it's not an ethical thing for me unless it's like you know, really trying to get kids to buy it or something. But for the most part, it's just a design decision. It's not something that it's something that I think kind of detracts from gameplay. And so I didn't want to do it anymore. I, I took it out and I changed it to one in-app purchase to all color schemes because the cosmetic in-app purchases didn't really change the game. You can change the colors and it didn't really change it. Same with downloadable content. Change, I mean, if you download um, an update with different kind of game modes, that's fine for me. But I just really didn't like the kind of in-app purchases that actually changed the way the game was played. And, and so I decided to take them out. And again, just to reiterate, it's not, it's not really an ethical thing. It's just design-wise, I just didn't like it. I wasn't happy with it, so I decided I'm not going to do that. Pivot was my next game. I'm getting near the end here. Pivot's my second game. Um, and I just wanted to quickly show you how this came to be. It's a similar process to Polymer. I, I brainstormed a bunch of ideas. This was like my first, uh, I wrote this in a sketchbook, so when I first saw it, um, but, and this is the idea I kind of went with sort of a path, that you're a ball on the path of moving around, and you have to avoid obstacles flying by you. That kind of changed and moved on to something a little bit different, where you're a ball on a stick on a path, and you're 
moving along the path and spinning and trying to avoid obstacles. I was really inspired by Super Hexano. The thing on the top left is just like a, a, I hadn't really drawn in code before. I had always used sprites. Everything was in Photoshop, and I printed or I you know, drag them in and put them on the screen. But with Pop, with Pivot, I wanted to actually draw in code. I wanted to make procedurally generated tracks and things like that. So that was a big hurdle that I had to learn. And that was just one process right there: the mountains, making those mountains appear based on the values in the code. Big win to that um, Building on my skills. I could never have done Pivot if I hadn't done Palmer. And it's just like, basically Palmer was a tutorial for Pivot. Every game you make is practice for the next game. I, there's no way I could have made this game if I hadn't made Palmer, just because there's so many things I learned. Um, so, so if I made two, it's done an abstract art style and it's difficult as fuck. <laughs> and I would never have been able to make game two if I hadn't already made game one, so much more complex programmatic. Um, pivot launch. I, uh, this is the rankings and stuff. Um, launched August 1st, 2013. Android launched a couple of weeks later. It got up to 41st in games and 74th in apps. And so far to date, it's got about 50,000 sales. And it was Apple's free app of the week. And it got about 2.5 million downloads. And during that week, it was awesome because even though during that week I didn't make any money, after that week, the sales were way more sustained um, because of the way that, I don't know what it was, maybe it was people talking about it, spreading the word, but it was amazing. And this is a trailer for it. That. The conclusion, um, before I say the conclusion, actually, I just wanted to say I can't take all the credit for this. My wife is in PR and she's done so much for me in terms of helping me get, figure out how to talk to the press, how to um, write a press release, how to make a press list, all these things. It's amazing. I, I, I think that really is a, one of the biggest reasons that I've had, I got the coverage that I did because she helped me figure out how to. Um, what's next for me? Game 3 will start the same way. I have some ideas in my head. I don't know where they're going to go, but I'll probably do the same thing. Start a dumb idea. Eventually, it'll turn into something real. Um, iterate a lot. Polish. Never stop learning. And the moral of the story is that the only way to get better at making games is to make games. It's really the only thing you can do. Um, people ask me a lot, like, how do you get better? How do you learn? Just gotta make games. Don't worry too much about the tools. Figure out what your goals are and just make games that lead to that. And obviously, this is true with anything. If you wanna get better at playing guitar, play guitar. Um, so, make lots of games, keep trying, keep making. No matter how much they suck, just make stupid games. It doesn't matter. All it is is about learning. Um, each game is a tutorial for the next. Um, I learned so much from all these dumb ideas. And basically, just the two steps are think of an idea and try to make it. If you don't make it, if you, if you fail, then who cares? You still learn something. I tried to make Tetris three times over the course of that one and a half years, and I failed, uh, I think, twice until the third time I finally figured out how to do it. But each time I did it, I figured out what the problem was and what I needed to know to figure it out later. Um, also, if you want to make games, don't just, don't, I wouldn't recommend just copying what I did to learn. Do, you know, figure out what your goal is and do that. And basically, the goal should determine the tools, not the other way around. You know, don't just be like, oh, Python's the way to start. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, depending on what you want to do. So go and make a stupid game now. And that's all I have. So, thanks for being Polymer, um, I made on iOS, and I made it Pogo Studio, which was just iOS. 
about what, two months ago, Middlepick has actually ported it to Android, which is awesome. And then Pivot, I made in Unity, which um, is cross-platform. So that so Polymer Android launched a year after iOS, and Pivot Android launched a week after iOS. So it's and that's why I really recommend going cross-platform if you can. Because Android doesn't make as much money as iOS for sure, but it's still something you do not miss out. Yeah, uh, I know you mentioned your uh, your wife helping you with kind of the PR aspect and such. Uh, but just looking back at your your like first stupid games, uh, it seems like you had a fan club kind of already. I'm curious where that came from. Yeah, I basically I I had been doing um, let's see, 2010. Let's see. So I started making games in October 2010. I started making music for games in February 2010, um, and I had sort of been building my Twitter. Following, I didn't have a ton. I probably had like 400 followers at the time, but still, I, I talked to a lot of people in game development. I worked with a lot of people because of um, doing music for them, and I started to get to know a lot of the people. So they were they were really supportive of me because they they knew that I was a musician and they were they really wanted me to succeed. And so yeah, it was it was amazing. And if you're not on Twitter, I really recommend it. I am totally stupid on Twitter, but that's the point of it. I mean, is I. I I was telling my wife recently, she never really liked it before, even though she's in PR, but she um, finally realized that the reason that she didn't like it before was that she was following companies that didn't really interact with her. Um, and the way to use Twitter is to just follow people you respect and talk to them like real people. Um, and with the press, um, I see a lot of people just reaching out right when their game comes out and saying, like, hey, my game's out, check it out. And they're just not going to care that much. Whereas if you <laughs> said something like this yesterday, um, at a panel, but if you see a press person talking about something, just respond to them and, um, and just have a conversation. And it's amazing where that goes, and later they'll remember you, hopefully, and be like, oh, this is like a real person that is actually making a game, not just a spam, spammer person. So I really recommend it. Anything else? Do I take what? Oh, um, I've done that a little bit, but I've had, I've actually found it really difficult. I always think it would, I always think it'll be a really good learning experience um, when there's like an open source game. Uh, like I think Cannibal was open source, and I looked at it thinking, oh, this is gonna be a great learning experience. And it's just, it's really hard to get into someone else's code and just understand it. It takes hours and hours um, to really just get where the thought process is, because there's so much in, in code that builds, builds upon each other that it's not the kind of thing that you can just look at. And it's almost just as hard as learning a, a game in general, just like learning someone else's game. It's just, it's a big process, even if it can be a learning experience. Uh, anything else? How do you find the process of going from making your little prototypes to actually polishing off the whole game? Do you find that to be very hard and very learning? Um, it was it was stressful, but not hard. I got really, really obsessed. I I, um, I have this personality where sometimes I'm totally lazy and sometimes I'm totally obsessed. And so for that six months off of programming, I kind of took a break, didn't really care. And then suddenly I started making games again. And then from January to April, which is when I made Palmer, um, I was also a full-time music teacher at the time. So I would during lunch breaks, right after school, at all the time. I had free, just programming, programming, and all this other stuff. It's all I was thinking about. And um, it's weird because the look of the game was actually pretty much done. Uh, or, or not the look, but the basic structure of the gameplay was pretty much done at the end of January. The next three months were polishing just tons of things, just making sure it's exactly the way I wanted it to look. So it was hard in that there was a lot to do and it was stressful, but I never really felt. Like, I didn't want to, I was just so obsessed with it. I just kind of keep doing this, keep doing this, until it's done. Thanks so much, everyone. Appreciate it.